Okay, I think the attendee count is just leveling out. So welcome again to um, this Government Hub and the Key Clerks Conference. Um, if you've got any questions as we go through, please use the Zoom Q&A function and uh, pop them in there and we'll answer the questions. Um, well, this has been a fairly strange year, hasn't it? And um, for our, some of us more than others, I think actually um, uh, for all the clerks we talk to, and we talk to thousands every year, um, it has been particularly odd time clerking meetings uh, generally remotely. And quite a lot of what we'll talk about today is reflecting on that, how it might change some of the things we've done at Governor Hub and the Key to, to help with that. Um, I'll hand over in a minute to uh, my boss at the key, uh, Chris Kenyon. I'll talk a little bit then about um, the changing landscape for clerking around the country. Um, we've then got who to us all is probably as close to a rock star as you can get in our current community. Uh, you may have even heard her on Radio 4 this morning. So Jackie Weaver will be talking about the impact of professional clerking. Um, Sharon, many of you know, will be talking about the National Association of School and College Clerks, uh, which uh, she's, she's recently launched. Um, and then we'll talk, be talking about some of the things that uh, we've added to Governor Hub and the Key for School Governors, and also some of the things we've got um, in the pipeline. Quick break, and then a panel session from uh, a number of esteemed colleagues who will be commenting on best practices and challenges around clerking um, but that's all going to be driven based on your questions so um, take the opportunity to uh, pop the questions in the q a if you've got them as we go through but first off um one of the changes for us in recent years uh, at govern hub is that we became part of the key so this happened in april 2020 just about the same time as we were all going into lockdown so that was quite unusual um, but one of the unusual things for me personally is that I've now got a boss. And I'm going to hand over to him now. So Chris, who is uh, uh, CEO at The Key. Chris. Thank you very much, Neil. And, and uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. I'm, I'm at an event um, up in Leeds today with 200 um, MAT CEOs and reflecting on the last 18 months when education has been turned upside down. And I think one of the the privileged positions we're in um, at the key is we work with almost 17,000 schools across the UK. And in a sense, we've been witness, um, sometimes able to help as well, but, but witness to just the extraordinary efforts that happened in your schools. And I know that you will have been the same as Clark's, seeing the heroic efforts of um, head teachers uh, supporting both their communities, their staff and their pupils through what has been um, really very um, um, turbulent times. A few things I, I think um, one of the things I reflect on when you go through a period of very significant change is what can you take from it? And I sort of before we focus on today, I, I wanted to share that I think some amazing things have happened during this period. Um, there isn't a head teacher in the country or a leadership team that I've met over the last uh, year who haven't, in a sense, gone through this journey of, oh my word, what are we going to do? You know, nothing has trained me for what I have to do now. Um, and then they've pulled together and they've applied creativity and they've got a plan and then they've gone and executed and discovered that actually um, by working together as a team that they're able to, to take on any challenge that hits the school. And I think there's been a real change in the conversation um, at a national level about understanding that um, schools themselves, whether or not they're in a trust or in a local authority, um, have an enormous capacity to deliver uh, change at speed. Like there isn't a school in the country that hasn't um, adopted new technology, changed the way they work, um, had to um, support free school school meals, support communities in distress. And um, you know, never again let anybody outside the sector say that schools aren't able um, of executing great change at speed, um, because it's something we've seen very, very clearly. Um, on top of that, I think there's a view that while we continue and in, in, in the governance side, we clearly um, we work within the constraints of um, legislation and um, uh, various national education acts. It's also clear that best practice and ways of reorganizing can be learned from each other. And the evidence-based 
peer-to-peer led um, innovation is something where, you know, whether or not it's governors looking at how other schools are um, operating as governing teams, or if it's head teachers look, looking at schools around them, there's an enormous capacity to learn from each other. There are very few problems, I think, that any school in the UK now faces that haven't been solved by another school in the UK. And one of the things we're trying to do at the group um, is to help accelerate the speed at which good ideas and good practices um, are shared across the UK. Um, a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Um, we are delighted to have Governor Hub in the group. You know, I, I'm a, a chair of governors in a school in North London. And uh, when I became chair of governors and started using Governor Hub, it was really clear to me you know, um, that it was a tool that made a big difference to how we were organized um, as, a, as a set of governors. And I had worked in cloud computing and used lots of collaborative software, things like 365 um, and uh, the, the Google suite for many years. And yet, when I stepped up to be a chair of governors, like most, most governors, I felt out of my depth and not really clear I knew what I was doing. And I'm saying that as the CEO of the key. Um, and I know that, that that feeling is common amongst many of the governors that you work with. And for me, there were really uh, well four places I looked for help. I mean, one was for my head teacher and getting guidance from them. Critically, uh, Maria, who's our clerk, uh, was a massive aid to me in terms of giving me structure about, okay, this is what you need to be focused on. This is what the, you, know, you as a board did last year. Here are some ideas that are going on elsewhere in the local authority. Um, and here's what you promised you'd do last time. So um, I had teacher, our clerk, um, and then having the structure of um, Governor Hub was a big, you know, one of the reasons we decided to bring the company, uh, bring Governor Hub into the group was because we just thought it was an excellent tool that made a difference to how we as governors were operating um, as leaders in the system. So I want to highlight a couple of other things just at a group level so you're aware of why they're in the group and how they all fit together. Um, you will be well, very familiar with the key for school governors. We support over 6,000 schools with the key for school governors. The key for school leaders is, supports about 13,000 head teachers right now, or 12,000 um, schools um, right now. But we're also investing in other systems around the management information system of schools. And I won't go into a sales pitch about that, but ultimately we think that schools improve when leaders are willing to make change. And that to make change, you have to have context, really good granular context about what's going on in a school. Um, and the reason we invest in those systems is because we think that helps leadership teams, be they the um, head teacher of a school or the um, governance team to understand what they're doing. So that's a little bit about group. We're delighted to have Governor Hub in the group and you'll be hearing much more from Neil and the team about how Governor Hub and the, the key for school governors work together. But I just want to end my welcome to you by saying a big thank you for all of the extraordinary work that you do. Um, I know um, uh, whether you're doing it in the context of a trust or wherever in the country you are, however many miles you've had to travel and however many different systems you've had to dial in to over the last uh, two years, your work makes an extraordinary difference to schools, helps governors ask good questions of uh, leadership teams. Um, and that really does make a difference to the 10 million pupils that we have in education in the UK today. So thank you for your work. I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. I'll hand over back to Neil and team. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's, it really is um, uh, noticeable when I go around the country and talk to government services, clerking teams, governors, and lots and lots of clerks, you know, how pivotal clerks are as a part of our education system. Um, sadly, probably an uh, under-respected one and under-rewarded, um, but uh, I think, you know, hopefully we can, as a group, change that over time. Talking changing over time, is clerking changing right now? Um, as we talked about a little bit in the intro, there's been a lot of uh, change over the last 18 months. Um, very early on, April, uh, uh, April, May 2020, there was an incredible rate of change, you know, much faster than we've ever seen in the sector as meetings went online, government training went online, um, and it pivoted much more rapidly than we expected it to. You know, we probably saw several years worth of advancement in terms of using technology for governor meetings. Um, we saw a few years of advancement in a few weeks. It was amazing. But looking back, now we're somewhat wiser. You know, what is the impact on the, uh, on the sector and on clerking? of the pandemic. 
very interesting report from uh, the National Foundation for Education Research that came out recently. Oh, by the way, these slides uh, will we'll send off to you later and there's a link off to the report from the slides. One of the things that pulls out though is that there's a learning opportunity for governing boards around the country and particularly around considering the use of technology and how, what it could play in governments. I mean, this is a sector we've been in for nearly 10 years now. So we've seen a, a gradual uptake, more boards going paperless and so on. But we're probably at a pivotal point now where um, everyone has seen that um, online meetings can work. In some ways they're better, in some ways they're not. But uh, I, I guess the thing that no one can deny now is that they, uh, that they, they actually can be done logistically. One of the things we saw in Governor Hub, looking over about 10,000 meetings over the last few years, is that attendance actually goes up with remote meetings. So we went up uh, on average uh, between one and one and a half attendees um, for those meetings on Governor Hub during, during lockdown, which is, which is fascinating. It's almost counterintuitive, but we think that um, the fact that meetings were easier to attend meant that uh, more governors attended. Also, uh, this is less clear in the data, but it looks like meetings came slightly earlier in the day. So perhaps um, for working governors, those uh, it's, it's easier to get to a meeting at five o'clock, whereas normally perhaps it would have been six o'clock in the past. So um, that may have um, benefits as well, particularly to the well-being of um, senior leaders. Uh, one of the other things, and this came out in the report as well, is that clerks seem to have become more central to the operation. So perhaps previously when you're meeting face-to-face uh, -face more regularly, governments would turn to the head or chair. But anecdotally, um, we've seen this and, um, and the report picked up as well, where actually now it's more the clerk uh, as at the centre of more of those communications. So that's uh, an interesting change and perhaps signals the way things may develop over time. Um, Governor Hub itself has been incredibly busy. We've had, um, I think, our three busiest days in the last month. And before the summer holidays, we had our previously busiest days on the site. Uh, we regularly now get about over 100,000 active visitors every month. Um, but, but that to one side, the other thing we've noticed is that governors are actually spending more time online on, on the site. So this has gone by about 30 to 40%. So um, that sort of move of work from paper to online, I think is also signaled by what we're seeing there on Governor Hub. Um, we're also seeing the move for some of the, um, the duller aspects of governance, things like tracking declarations, tracking DBS, tracking whether people, uh, governors have read and understood keeping children safe in education, tracking code of conduct, things like that, which are really important. And some of those have statutory requirements against them as well. But they've always been a little bit of a faff when you're doing it by paper. If you've got to get people to sign off their deck, I don't need to tell you, everyone on this call knows this far better than I. But you know, you have that, that meeting at the start of the year where everyone has to fill in their declarations and sign them off. We, we've done that online now on Government Hub, and the use of that feature over the last 18 months has gone through the roof. It really is taken on. So, so some of that normal paperwork has now moved online as well, and that's, that's interesting to see. Well, first off, we're now going to get you to do a bit of the work, so we're going to have a poll. This one is really about um, use of tech for uh, governance and particularly um, how, if at all, has your board's use of technology for governance changed since the pandemic began? Now, if I press the right buttons, you should see a poll has magically appeared in front of you. If you can sort of answer, say, well, use it a bit more, use it much more, that same amount, use it a bit less, use it a lot less, and we'll see how that goes. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, right. Well, 
that's let me share the results with you. So as you can see, um seventy percent use it much more, uh thirty percent use it a bit more, and then everything else is uh playing catch up. So that's over does a quick mental arithmetic. So 97% plus uh, are using it more or much more, which is, is quite a start. And, and what we've seen elsewhere. So we ran that, um, the same poll with some um, MAT governance coordinators last week, and um, they had about the same split in terms of uh, use of technology. So yeah, I think what you've just said there in terms of the poll absolutely backs up what we've seen on on Golden Hub and, and at the key. One of the other things, this was fascinating. So looking at key for school governors, we can see what governors are searching for when they come to the site. And this is, it's almost like tracking the mood of governance across the country. And if you look at these three time period. So April 2020, just so we're going into lockdown in June 2020, things settling down a little bit in June 2021. Look at what the top search terms were. So April 2020, coronavirus, safeguarding, um, safeguarding coronavirus, bereavement policy. Can you believe it? Back in April 2020, that made the top 10 search terms on key for school governors. You know, how, how shocking is that really you know, in hindsight? June 2020, coronavirus safeguarding so, so is still right up there, um, but perhaps some of the other terms start to drop out. As we move forward to June 2021, then pretty much it's back to normal now in terms of what people are using us for. You know, I think we've uh, perhaps got so got into a new normal, but the um, uh, business as usual is almost back now. I think. And that's certainly what we're seeing online now. Um, one of the things looking forward though is um, is around hybrid meetings. Even before um, uh, lockdown, we were talking to a number of governor services teams or old clerking teams around the country about remote clerking, particularly. But there it was very much in the context of reducing clerks. Um, travel times to meetings. So in rural counties, I'm here in rural Norfolk. Um, you know, it's not unusual for clerks to have to travel 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour to get to a meeting, um, which obviously is all um, time, travel costs, etc. So we were talking to a number of services about how how we could support remote meetings. But generally speaking, it was um, a background idea. It wasn't something which was really front of mind for anyone. In the sector. April 2020, that all changed. And I think um, since then, one of the things we've seen is that uh, clerks have become adept at clerking meetings remotely. And they've definitely seen some of the benefits. And just pulling out a few of the things we've seen recently, both from the DFE, but also on social media around hybrid meetings. Uh, this, this tweet here from um, the Diocese of Norwich, Matt Governance, is around a, a device there testing out which has got a, a camera and speaker for these sort of hybrid meetings but um this is one of the things i think which may actually stick long term we'll see and it'd be interesting to get your take on this in a moment with another poll but the meetings where you've got governors in the room and governors connecting remotely um may be something which is is almost a permanent fixture but Let's see what your views are. Okay, if you wouldn't mind answering this one. So um, how do you intend to run your meetings this year? So from here till uh, next next July, fully remote, mix of remote and face-to-face, -face, meetings with a mix of in-person and remote, fully face-to-face, -face, I don't know. Yeah, so there again, if you see the um, uh, results there, very few are going to be fully 100% remote, but some mix of 
these hybrid meetings and a mix of remote and face to face. What we've heard anecdotally quite a bit is that you know, maybe committee meetings will all be online, maybe full board meetings in person. Um, eight percent fully face to face. Very interesting. You know, cast your mind back two years, and what would we have said? You know, I don't. I don't think anybody would have been looking at remote meetings but now they sort of seem to be a, a, a fixture. So the, um, as I say, one of the other big changes for us as a team is that we're now part of the key. Uh, we've also grown quite a bit over the last um, uh, few years. And for some of you, and looking down the participant list, I recognise a lot of uh, names there will have been working for us for, with us for many years. Uh, you'll recognise quite a few of the faces here, but there's also quite a few new faces and quite a few new dogs. That's the other thing we managed to accumulate uh, during lockdown was uh, quite a few uh, uh, pet dogs, which is all to the good, I think. One thing we're really trying to do, though, is, is particularly maintain that level of friendliness. The, and this is particularly, um, we think, applicable when working with clerks. We, uh, we're all professionals, but you know we really want to empathize with the problems you've got the challenges you've got um, we built govern hub based on discussions with clerks particularly and we've always um, targeted it to make sure that it, it solves your problems uh, that's always something we're we're keen to hear from so do let us know if there's anything we can do to make your life even just a little bit easier saving a, a minute for every clerk per meeting really adds up when you've got 6,000 clerks, I think 7,000 clerks now use GovHub. It really adds up. But at this point, I'm going to hand over to someone who we have worked with for, for many years, and many of you will know, uh, Sharon Warmington, um, founder of the National Association of School and College Clerks. And I think, Sharon, you're going to share from your tech. Yeah, I will, I, will share, I, will, I will share um, from, from mine, just because it, it, I like to be in control, you know me, Neil. <laughs> there speaks a the clock, there speaks a clock. <laughs> right, um, thank you so much, um, first to, to Governor Hub for um, inviting me um, to, to, to speak and to share this. For anybody who knows me, if you've listened to the, the Governor's podcast or just heard me um, comment on, on things in the past, you'll know that my um, relationship with, with Governor Hub um, has been quite a long one, actually. I remember meeting you, Neil, years ago, at least five years ago, I think, when I first founded the National Black Governors Network. And um, I'm pleased to say that Governor Hub have supported um, from the get-go the um, National Association of School and, and, and College Clerks. And it is really um, nice to join you on this um, conference. I won't be able to stay for all of it because I've got another meeting at three, but I just wanted to share with you what NASC was all about. For those of you who, who don't know, especially, um, and um, just to give you a bit, bit of background on me, I'm going to switch my camera off because it's a bit distracting. Um, for, for, for me. Um, so um, I'm, I am a clerk and I absolutely love it. I, at my height of clerked eight schools, which was crazy because I remember one year I counted, I think it was 120 meetings and I was working with supporting over a hundred governors um, and senior leaders during that year and it nearly killed me. Um, so any clerk who does um, multiple schools, I literally take my hat off to you. But I clerk a trust board for an alternative provision and I clerk a maintained school as well. Um, but I have clerked, I think, in almost every single school setting, whether it's a single sex, whether it's a grammar school, um, whether it's an independent school, um, alternative provision, all of them. And so I've used all of that knowledge um, in creating the association. 
but I also am a corporate governance trained practitioner, which means I actually sat an exam in, in corporate governance. Um, and so I, I take that practice to the private sector. So I work um, with organizations that are in the housing sector, charity sector, all across the private sector, both nationally and internationally. And I say to, to schools, when I'm going in as clerk, I don't leave that knowledge at the door we bring who we are to every space that we occupy and so whatever you learn if you are clerking in a in a secondary school and also in a primary school you are bringing that knowledge that you've that you've gained in that secondary setting into that private sec setting whether um conscious or subconsciously and you shouldn't be um afraid of drawing on those experiences and bringing that knowledge so that your governing body understand the professional that you are. So those are just some of the um, companies that I've that I've worked with. But in terms of NASC, what we did, and I say we, it's myself and my partner in crime, Fee Stag. Um, for those of you who know her, will know her well. She's, um, you know, well known in the space. And those of you who don't, just um, look her up. Um, I think her moniker is Dog Paws um, on her blog. But we sat in a conference um, a few years ago and thought, mm, we can do better than this. And it wasn't to say that the organization wasn't doing well. It's just that it was evident to us that when you're talking to clerks, you have to um, speak from that lived experience. You have to know what it actually means to be a clerk rather than somebody who's what I call developed book knowledge about um, the profession. And so we went straight to the clerking network that we had access to and gathered information and data and pulled together an interim report that was called the um, Pay and Conditions um, Report for Clerks. And that is still available on our, on our website, nasc.co.uk. And we published that in February, 2020, just before for the first lockdown. And um, the aim was to create um, NASC as the organization it is today, back then. But lockdown sort of threw that out the window and it meant that we um, had to put it on hold because as you know, March, 2020 changed the life of every clerk um, in what we had to do. So then after getting used to lockdowns and um, virtual meetings and sort of resettling, um, we created our newsletter called Clark's Chronicle, which the first edition went out in November, 2021, so this year. And that was um, on the back of, to be honest, um, Neil mentioned the bereavement policy that was um, something that was searched for um, regularly um, in April, I think it was last year. And that was on the back of, um, I as a clerk experienced the, the death of a head teacher um, that wasn't COVID related, but um, the, the impact for me as clerk and how, who do you speak to, who do you go to, who, who's the right person to notify first, and also a trustee some weeks um, after that. So it was two bereavements, completely unexpected. And I was searching for a bereavement policy. I was searching as a clerk with the, how best to handle it. And, and, you know, and if anything happened to me as clerk, who would pick up, who would know, you know, where to find my draft minutes or, or where to find this or where to find that. And so that was the impetus that, that made me um, create the first Clark's Chronicle and write about that experience. And since then we've published three, our fourth one is coming in October and those are completely free to any Clark or governance professional working um, in, the, in the sector. And then we launched, we decided to, to put a, a date in the diary and say, this is the date that we're, we're going to make it all happen. And that was the Clark's conference that we um, put together and, and ran on the 3rd of September. So just a few um, short weeks ago, we ran that conference and we had over 800 registrations and almost 600 clerks um, on that session um, with a variety of speakers. And it was really, really well received. And what we found is that it's because 
we as clerks were very disjointed in terms of there may be groups that a local authority puts together or groups that clerks have put together, but there's no national recognition and no national body that in, um, embraces all clerks. And so that's what NASC was about. And so we officially launched last Friday. Um, and by that, I mean, we were frantically, literally, if you've never built a website from scratch, trust me, is an experience and a half because you have to think about and, and write every single bit of content. It wasn't just a case of adding things onto it. It was actually pulling the whole thing together but we did it as professional clerks, we did it and it is there and available um, for you. So the membership itself is website driven. Um, it is open to anybody working in the governance space because we have had governors who read the Clerks Chronicle and say, can we join? And absolutely. But the difference with NAS to any other organization um, working in this space is that all of our content will be um, from the clerk's viewpoint and what the clerk needs to do. So if it's a case of um, exclusions, um, exclusion panels and what you need to do, it won't be taking it from the governor's viewpoint. It will be walking the clerk through the process and that's what makes it different. We, we do recognize that not everybody will um, want to or um, be able to join for whatever reason. So we have got free stuff and that will be the Clarks Chronicle, our newsletter. We've um, decided that that will remain free to, to all um, who want to read it. Our conferences and any of the reports that we do will remain free to the um, profession and any national updates that, that we, we get will also be free. But in terms of the paid membership, we've kept it cost effective because 49 pounds per year for something that is going to support professional development of clerks isn't expensive at all and so within that um, figure you will get forms and templates publications you'll get live master classes so the training element alone within that um, annual fee is is very very cost effective we'll also be putting on pre-recorded webinars I'm trying to create a NASC YouTube, so it's like a Q&A, but it's um, playing it in the, in the 21st century where, you know, sum it up in, in 90 seconds or two minutes um, rather than having to wade through lots of um, paperwork. And also one thing that, that I do regularly um, informally is coaching and mentoring of new clerks coming into the space. And so professional clerking is part of that. The asterisks just mean that some things will have an additional fee. And that just depends on if we've got to bring in external speakers um, or we've got to pay for, for something, then we may have to make a small charge. But for most of the stuff we will do, it will be free for, for members. So the main benefits are the networking and that will be whether it's virtually or I do see a time where when we've got members, um, member groups in different regions that they will be able to meet locally as a region and get to know each other that way. As I've said, there'll be member only offers um, for our, our, our clerks and then where it is opened up more publicly that um, there will be a charge for non-members national conversations i wanted um, our members to be aware of the fact that nasc as a body um, represented by myself sits on the dfe's advisory group on governance so when it comes to things like the the clark incompetency framework which i know is being re, um, reviewed um, we have a voice at that table i attend the meetings personally and when i can't attend um, fee att uh, attends to represent NASC. So your voice is being um, heard at that level. The CPD, as I've, as I've mentioned before, everything that we do, if you've ever um, been involved in anything that I do, you'll know that I'm very, very um, keen to make sure that um, it's high quality and of value. 
um, that's always the desired outcome um, from my viewpoint and I know that that's the same for Fiona. In terms of our profession, um, we are giving opportunities for clerks to, um, to write articles for the newsletter, to raise their profile in that way, and just to share their knowledge and experience. We're not sitting here saying we know everything because we don't, but what we um, are doing is opening up the space for clerks to share their best practice so that we can all learn and benefit. And your profile as well, any member has the right to put on their CV that they are a member of NASC. And I think it's really, really important. And if you enter a space as a, um, a new clerk, and I hope you say, if you haven't got a governor hub, then you need to get it. Um, but also to be able to say to them, if you haven't got um, NASC, then um, you know I'd like a commitment that you will invest in that um, on my behalf to help and support my CPD. Because I think, I mean, I personally do have a list of requirements before I take on any clerking um, role. And one of them is that the school has to be a member of, of Governor Hub. Um, the other one is that they have to support my professional development in some way. And so this will definitely be on that, on that list as well. And then just finally, um, recognition. We are looking at... Um, providing um, a, 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 a platform to recognize the, the service of clerks. And so the NASC awards are coming. Um, just give us 12 months whilst we're um, putting everything else together. Um, but the aim is that we will um, recognize who we are um, as, as clerks. And again, not just an add on to another awards um, event, but clerks are recognizing clerks um, for their work that they do. Um, as a corporate governance practitioner myself, I think it's really, really important that clerks are able, in terms of their professional development, to look outside the sector. So to use your knowledge that you've gained in the education sector and also use it um, to grow your, your, um, your, your knowledge in other sectors. So um, one particular thing I'm working on with the person who trained me in corporate governance, Dr. Carl George, is looking at a hybrid course for clerks to bridge the gap so that you can take on roles um, as well as your clerking role, but take on roles, um, governance roles in other areas um, and other sectors. And then the, the thing that is usually the elephant in the room that nobody ever wants to talk about, that I have no problem talking about, is pay and paying conditions and making sure that clerks are getting paid their worth. I mean, I had one clerk wanting to join the network and asked if she could pay in instalments. And I just thought that, that it was so sad that that, you know, for the sake of 50 pounds, you've got to be seriously underpaid if you're A, um, you know, um, feeling that you can't afford it and B, you're asking for instalments and that's no reflection on her. That's a reflection in my mind on the profession and how seriously underpaid it is. And um, just reminding you that we are um, advocating on your behalf to make sure that the paying conditions of clerks um, is addressed. So I will take any questions. I know there's time for questions, but if, if I have to disappear, then please do drop an email to us, info at nasc.co.uk, and we are open to, to answer any questions that, that you have. Any answers that we can't give, we will find them for you. And um, enjoy the rest of the, the session, and I hope that that's been useful for you. That's, that's great. Thank you, Sharon. Actually, one of the questions has come in, Sharon, on the, oh, okay. the Q&A, um, which is uh, from Catherine. She says, uh, can the school join and ask so that any future clerk has a school, or do you have to join as, as an individual? Um, we have been asked about corporate membership. Um, we are happy to have um, what we're calling group members or multiple members. Um, we haven't reduced the price for that. And any school who um, pays for the membership, if their clerk moves on, then yes, we can just swap out the, um, the access. So there's no problem with that at all. Just get in touch and we can, we can sort that out. Okay, now you may not want to answer this, but Sue has asked, what do you think is reasonable pay for a clerk? 
oh, I have no problem talking about money. I'm a businesswoman. Um, so um, I always use myself an example. I never change my rate um, um, in terms of whether it's a secondary school or a primary school, an academy or a maintained, because governance is governance is governance. And something I heard for the first time at the NAS conference that was said by somebody who works in the FE sector was that we are bringing assurance Clarks, you are bringing assurance to your governing bodies. I say that I am bringing value. I don't exchange my time for money. So my rate, my minimum rate for approximately 10 to 12 meetings per year is five and a half thousand. I don't do hourly rates because I don't think that truly reflects what Clarks are doing because we work on sociable hours, we work weekends, um, we literally, if you've got a governing body of, of 10, 12 people, we are available to those 10, 12 people at any time. And one may be during working hours, another may be during the evenings, another may be at weekends. And so we're available to them. And so I don't think you can, you can boil that down to an hourly rate. So I always um, have an annual figure that I straight line across the year so that the school is paying the same amount per month um, so that they know where they stand and I know where I stand and any ad hoc meetings in between that, then I charge at a fixed rate as well. But I am doing a session on pay. Um, um, if anyone's interested, that'll probably be in the spring term now, but, but yeah, hope that answers Excellent. the question. Oh, that was great, thank you. And there's another question coming. I'm going to piece that one for the panel session later, which okay. is uh, using terms clerk or governance professional. So mm -hmm. the whole fire on that one. Um, excellent, well, thanks, Sharon. Um, next up is um, a clerk that um, many will be familiar with, but in the uh, in, in a somewhat different setting. Um, just. Um, I don't think any of us can have watched that video that went mad on social media without a little, well, I think perhaps two pangs in our heart. One was for, for Jackie, who, uh, who was uh, a clerk in charge of a, let's describe it as a robust meeting online. I think the other pang was, my goodness, how come parish councils are now getting such coverage when school governors get so little? But uh, on that on that point, Jackie, perhaps I can hand over to you to talk briefly on the impact of professional clerking. Thank you. And um, as I'm looking at the slide that you're very um, uh, you've prepared for me, I'm just mindful if this interview had taken place yesterday, I'd still be wearing the same top. <laughs> So I'm um, glad we're having it today. <laughs> um, I, in, in terms of an introduction, um, I think it might be helpful if, if, I, if I put my own um, experience in your own context. I think that would be useful. I mean, first of all, I have worked in the local council sector for, I like to say, a quarter of a century, because my God, that sounds an awful lot longer than 25 years, but it's 25 years. Um, and during that time, I have tried out the role of councillor, didn't like it much, lasted one term. That was clearly a role for other people. Um, I mainly didn't kind of enjoy that, that front face engagement with the public. <laughs> I preferred to sit in the background. Um, I have clerked um, for large and small councils over the years when they have been without a clerk. Um, running one large one for nearly a year while doing my own job, um, which ran five leisure centres. Every time the developer um, did a, another um, housing development, they also popped in another leisure centre and gave it to the council. Um, but for the largest part of my career, I have been the chief officer of the Cheshire Association of Local Councils. And if I had only known how many times that was going to be said over the last six months, I would have called for something shorter. Um, but in that role, um, my job is actually to support 234 town and parish councils across Cheshire. Now, I don't do it single-handedly, although to be honest, some weeks it feels like that. 
Um, but we are a small team, and I think that as I've listened to the speakers that have spoken before me this afternoon, what has struck me over and over again are the similarities between being a, a, a clerk to a uh, board. Governor, um, or being a governor, or being a councillor, the similarities are, are considerable. Um, and when I, I have some sympathy um, with what Neil said a moment ago about getting noticed since for that quarter century um, and longer, because I'm not the only person involved in town and parish councils, um, we too have really struggled to get people to take any notice of their local councils. And in the case of local councils, this is people who are spending your money and deciding on what you get it spent on. So it's, a, it, it's kind of um, probably harder for you to get noticed in that respect because you're not having a direct effect on people's purses. Um, so this last seven months um, has given me um, a platform. Um, it's given me a platform to do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, and some of them honestly have been weird. Um, but it's also given me an opportunity to, to get a, a name associated with town and parish councils and to be invited on the basis of that. So a lot of what I do um, is in the public eye at the moment. A lot of what I do, I didn't even do. Somebody just put it all together for me and there it appeared somewhere. Um, but it does give me an opportunity to do so many things that you don't see, like this, for example won't be seen i suspect on national tv tomorrow morning um but there's lots of things like this that i get involved in particularly around young people and including um more diversity um to encourage people to get involved in their local councils and effectively to make a change therein and we do have a couple of dissimilarities um, one is that we do actually have a national body, both for our clerks and for the councils themselves. And secondly, and really annoyingly, we do not have the ability to hold virtual meetings any longer. So the legislation that permitted us to do that um, fell in May um, of this year. And as yet, the government has not made its mind up about whether or not we think it's important, despite this being the one time that the whole of our sector, um, I could list them all, but you know, we, we don't always sing with one voice. But in this instance, everybody is saying the same thing. And again, very similar to the um, discussions you are having, that actually they are really an important part of our arsenal. Being able to hold virtual meetings has had a positive effect and we need to retain it. So perhaps shout for us on that again. So I guess, and then the similarities continue through, through everything I say, so I won't say anything unique, unique here. Um, we are all lucky to have such committed and passionate volunteers. Now, I started off by saying that I tried being a councillor and I didn't like it. I really didn't like it. And I think in this um, current day and age, being a councillor asks much more of you than it would have done 25 years ago. So I am eternally grateful to um, all those people who do volunteer on boards, as councillors, whatever. Um, but we often forget, um, as communities and as officers, um, that volunteers need support. You know, often in my um, sector, you know, somebody will say, we need volunteers to do something. Well, that's great. But volunteers don't spontaneously come together with one will and a vision for how they're going to implement that will. Okay, so they definitely need support. And again, in my own sector, the argument of, well, I did it in good faith. I, I really had good intentions when we took this decision doesn't cut it, nor does the I feel this is the right thing to do. Well, I feel like I'm about 35, but it doesn't make me 35. So we have to show them that there are repercussions if they get things wrong, because in turn, we want our various communities to have confidence in us. We want them to have confidence in the system. We want them to see that the rules are followed and we want to get it right. 
to show that it is fair. How do we achieve this? Well, we could decide that we were only ever going to have professional members. Hmm. I see a bit of a problem with that. Actually, I can see several problems with that. Diversity issues. Cost. I didn't like to put that first in case I look really cheapskate. And accessibility for the public. You know, really affect turning these things into what seems like a court of law. So the alternative is that we have this person called the professional clerk. And again, this is something that is key to our sector in that historically the role of clerk has always been seen as being a very junior post you know kind of like could be married to the chairman could just be employed by the chairman okay it's not necessarily seen as a protective and professional role so we we too have that difficulty where the role isn't always valued and by valued i mean in terms of the delivery of um, support and training, but also valued in paying conditions. And again, I can't be the only person that's ever seen a proposed um, job description that says that you, we need you to work 10 hours a week, Monday to Friday, nine to five. Okay, I'm not big on numbers, but that doesn't seem to quite add up to me. Or well, the alternative being, we pay um, 10 hours a week for this role. But of course, the previous clerk all would work 15. Okay. Not very modern practices, are they? And I think the other thing um, that you have heard me banging on about, as you've heard me speaking before, is about making sure that we have good working conditions for our clerks. Many of ours work from home and are expected to house the entire paper portfolio of a council for the past 50 years okay do have storage lockers but you know you can actually move them somewhere um and also we want to make sure that the environment that people work in is safe and by that i reference the handforth meeting and i don't think anybody would be queuing up to join handforth to clerk their meetings so we have a code of conduct that's all very good. We can be able to see how people should behave. But what it doesn't have are sanctions when that is breached. And government continues to say that in the principle that carrots are more effective than sticks. Hmm. How's that going for us? So not all our clerks experience handfuls. Otherwise, we would have a bigger recruitment problem than we do have a recruitment problem than we do now. And when we have a, a partnership of the clerk and the chairman, then we really are able to see something change within our communities. So that issue that I spoke about before of the public having confidence in what we're doing, your community having confidence in what we do, suddenly begins to grow. And I suppose the way I look at it is our volunteers bring heart, breadth of knowledge of, of your community, whatever that is, knowledge again of your community and we in turn bring structure order and hopefully a bit of quiet confidence that the rule book is there and that the rule book will be fairly followed i think that we saw real support for that back with the handful scenario when actually overwhelmingly the support um the responses i got from people were around how they how they want to see justice, whatever that means, um, done to the people that they thought were doing the wrong thing. They really wanted to see that the environment was safe and that when something goes wrong, there is somebody there to put it right. And I guess in, uh, finally, and I, I wasn't going to speak for very long, I'm mindful you have a very big um, programme this afternoon, speakers. I think for me, finally, the thing that we mustn't forget, and again, in part was picked up by one of your speakers earlier, is how vitally important it is that we have proper support for officers. And proper support is somewhere safe, like this, where you can go and receive support from your peers. And for me, that is hugely important 
and something that I certainly try to provide for my 234 back in Cheshire. I hope that's been of some interest. Um, I'm happy to come back for, for questions if, um, if that would be helpful, Neil. That's great. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I've, I've got to admit, I'm a little bit starstruck. Um, I think you're by far the most famous person I've spoken to in uh, quite some time. Um, but can I just share with you a couple of comments that have come in on, on the Q&A and in the chat. So one is from Nicola. She says, thank you. Your vile Zoom brought my daughter and I together during lockdown in solidarity. Me as a school clerk and her as a secretary at a college JCR at Cambridge. And actually in, in sort of similar um, vein, uh, Fenella said, um, a clerk, two primary schools, two parish councils. Lovely to be on Zoom with you. I think she's talking about you, not me. Maybe. Um, I've found my knowledge of local government clerking has helped massively with clerking for schools and quite a lot of overlap. I found my school governors are much more motivated than my parish councillors. Maybe it's due to the involvement with children and future generations. Uh, I'd like some of their enthusiasm, enthusiasm to rub off on the councillors, but uh, it is a challenge. Um, that's interesting, isn't it? I, I, I've been to a number of parish council meetings myself. And, and yes, I, I think probably the school governors that I've encountered probably are somewhat more engaged. Not, not completely, but generally speaking, I, I don't know if there's something there you, you could reflect on or comment on. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm among friends this afternoon. So I would say a community has the parish council it deserves. So that if um, you have a parish council that isn't fit for purpose in an area, it is because kind of like the community isn't behind it. I think of them more as a, a tool. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a mechanism by which you can get something done within your community. But frankly, if you don't want anything done in your community, if the biggest issue for you is reporting the potholes and the septic tank drainage is something that really you like to discuss from now until Christmas, who am I to say you should be more interesting? And we do have um, councils that I reference where they do incredible things locally. Um, if you have a look on our website, um, there's three little, oh, sorry, chant.org.uk, there's three little cameo videos um, that show what local councils were doing in their communities during COVID. And that was really interesting because historically parish councils don't work with the voluntary sector. Um, and what we saw was them really coming together and working well together. Some of that has stayed with us, which is, which is fantastic. So we do have, um, certainly in Cheshire, some of our larger councils even have, um, we moved to a, a, what we call a two-tier system, unitary authorities about nine years ago. And we are seeing some of our larger councils actually delivering services that urban and rural district councils used to do. 30 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I, and I think you're right. Uh, we probably, um, around here in, in rural Norfolk, saw the same thing where parish councils or local community groups particularly came into their own during lockdown. Uh, and I, I think that's maybe the thing, isn't it? Councils and governing bodies come together and effective when there's a purpose. Yeah. If there's something to achieve, that's really what, what brings them together. And I think you know, I've seen that time and again with school governing boards where you know, there's such a focus on improvement and getting things done. That really is a, a, a strong enabler. So thanks for that. Sorry, uh, can, I, can I just add a point? It's a really no, no, you can't come in, Jackie. No, you cannot interrupt. Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say, I'm going to red thinking about it now, um, is how how demotivating it is for clerks when they don't have the energy from, from members. One of the things I find, and in many ways I am also a clerk because I, I have my own board, is I sometimes feel like shouting at them, why don't you question me? You know, sort of, I've written your annual report. Surely you'd like something different than you had last year. I've presented your accounts. Don't you want to know why that's a thousand pounds more than it was? You know, and it's kind of like, no, just trust you. And, you know, that's great, but it isn't motivating me. 
Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Well, look, um, thanks ever so much for that, Jackie. Really appreciate it. Thanks also for agreeing to be on our panel later. So, um, other attendees, if if you want to uh, post a question to Jackie or for the other panelists, then pop it in the in the Q and A, and we'll pick that up in a bit. So next up is um, Ellie Shasha. So Ellie, one of our co colleagues here, Governor Hub and the Key, and Ellie, you're going to talk a bit about some of the recent developments and also some of the future developments, some of the things which are just in the office. I am, yeah, just for the next 10, one, 10 minutes or so before we grab a quick cup of tea. So uh, welcome, everybody. Hello. Thank you to those speakers that we've already heard. That's been brilliant. Just a real joy to listen to you both. Um, me, I'm afraid, not quite as exciting, I'm afraid. Uh, no jokes in this one, I'm afraid, but never mind. Uh, what I'm here really is I'm the product manager um, for the governance products at the Key, so for Governor Hub and the Key for School Governors. And it just means that it's my job to soak up all that information that all our end users, our clerks, our governors are giving us, things they need to improve, things that if we just had this, that would be really handy. All the things that are going well, that we want to do more of and to put them into, which basically means a, a roadmap, if you like, of where we're going to go to and when. Um, so today I'm just going to run through a few of the things that we've done most recently to check that you all know that they're there and, and check that you're happy with them and that you know what to do and to give you a bit of a story, if you like, of what we're going to be doing over the next, let's say, a year or so. So hopefully that will be of interest. Uh, Neil, I think you've got control of the slides there. So um, I think we might as well just move on to the next one. We have our two products. Uh, working together and as you can see by this incredible little uh, thing that Neil's put together for me here we're having a little makeover at half term so during half term when hopefully you're having a well-earned break um, but I know some of you may not uh, this will occur we're just really having a, a nice neat makeover to show that both of our products now are in the same family um, nothing's changing don't worry nothing's been put in different places or getting more tricky it's all the same products behind it we're just getting a bit more modern a little refresh some nice white space so you're not confronted with everything and you know where to go so hopefully you'll all um, like our changes governor hub blue staying look um, but we're we're just uh, coming together as a family so to speak um, and you'll see that across Governor Hub and the Key for School Governors and uh, GovernorHub.com. I'm going to th go through a few little things about that have been recently changed. And um, perhaps I'll, I'll actually show this on live, shall I, to show you how it works. I should be able to share my screen. Uh, yep. Let's see. Technical. Power of a live demo. Oh, yeah, it's coming through, Ellie, but you're muted. Well, I don't know what happens has happened with your sound. There, are you? Uh, can you unmute? Am I back again? You're back. For so what, if you show your screen, you're muted. <laughs> yes. well, well, you, you did it through, you did it through, through the, uh, the 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 uh, means of mime, and I will talk your 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 voices. Shall I do that? How should we do this? Do it that way, or perhaps perhaps put the um, put my slides back on. I will talk through them on my slides. I don't know why that didn't work. If you want to put the slides back on, I will just. I'll, I've got them on the slides anyway. I'll explain it. God knows what happened there. That's very strange. This is yeah. There was there was probably somebody in Facebook doing a a presentation yesterday when everything went off. Yeah, do you think? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. So some things some things that have come up most recently. Um, the top one there is that I know it's clerks. You've got loads of boards, loads of uh, services on along your washing line at the top there. So quite recently, we've now got the ability for you to um, pop into to the area, if you click on your name at the top of the screen and you can choose which um, 
services, which icons appear on your washing line along the top. So if you have some that you're in and out of all the time, you can make sure they're on your washing line and the rest of it you can just find in your groups as usual. That's really handy for me. I know <laughs> that was a wonderful thing when that's, that, uh, that uh, was launched. So hopefully you have all found that. If any of these things you haven't found or you have trouble with, just drop us a line in the support um, in the little chat bubble, if you like, and uh, we'll help you through it. Mark to sign. So hopefully you found this. We've had the ability to um, remotely, you know, mark a document as signed for, for a little while now. So that if you've got your minutes and they're, they're in your documents folder, the chair can go in, hover over the three dots and uh, mark that as signed by them. Uh, we have now as an extra little um, addition. We've got a report that you can now download. So what you'll have is then a report of all of your documents that are signed. Um, which means you can keep a track of them. You don't necessarily have to have that lever arch folder with the, the paper copies of everything printed out and the one missing that you're looking for. So if you want to go down the remote route and more and more of you are, so we're seeing this really, really getting busy now, you can go on there, click a sign and you've got the download of the report. Um, so you can keep track. Um, Another one about evidencing effort. Now, the Help Centre, you're all familiar with, I know, use all the time. Really great for new governors joining to find out how to do these um, various things across, across both products. Now, however, um, I think one aspect of Governor Hub that sometimes we, um, sometimes we forget perhaps to kind of talk about is that the fact that not only does it help you with your administrative processes and it helps you save time and all those sort of practical things, what it does is it acts as a body of evidence of your efforts. So um, I know I've been sat in an Ofsted inspection and the question, you know, you're, you know, your head says you're a robust board. Yes. Yeah, we don't. Oh, definitely. We are. Yes. And, you know, can you show me some evidence? And then you think, can I, can I, what's the evidence and all this sort of stuff. And I think one thing that you can do when you're using Governor Hub and the Key for School Governors is all you really need to do is talk through how you do that uh, you could talk through the fact that you know your notice board is where you communicate and so therefore you know what everybody else is doing everything is open and transparent because the conversations are there you know you know that you've got a calendar of regular meetings you know when they are and what they are and all those sorts of things so we've put these help um, center articles in so not only can you now have help on how do I work Governor Hub but you can also see the value behind it and perhaps and I know for clerks it's sometimes quite frustrating when you're trying to get your board engaged and realizing that this is the benefit of these sorts of tools so I do hope that they'll they'll help you and again always drop us a line and let us know um, if it's not what you're doing what you want it to or if it really is and that uh, we like to have that that knowledge can I have the next slide, please? There you go. One other little aspect, um, historical members. Now, this was, again, in response to requests coming in that we'd like to keep those details of members that are, have, have left the governing board. Um, yes, you can do this now. So in your governing board members list, there's a historical members section now. And as you can see, this is our demo. Um, so we can see that um, the governors have left the board um, down the timeline there. I do want to add a little tip, though. Because what we're finding is sometimes um, when people go to remove a governor, um, instead of clicking the remove, so you go into the governing board, I wish my thing had worked, it'd, it'd be much easier, wouldn't it? When you go into the <laughs> governing board, hover over the person's name and click remove, that takes them off the board. That will next, then that will bring up a little prompt that says, do you want to add any more information? And you can say why they've left or any notes that you need. And that will put them on this whole historical member section. Sometimes what people are doing by sort of by mistake is what they're thinking to do is they'll go into the term of office and they'll actually remove the appointment of that governor before removing them off the board. Now, all this does is turn them into uh, somebody on the board that's not a governor. And in the historical members record, we don't want anyone on there other than governors who had ceased to be governors. So those, for instance, your school business managers that might be on there because they put upload a lot of documents. You don't want to see those on the historical members. So they don't have a term of office and an appointment, a governor appointment. It's tricky, I know. It sounds like I'm not explaining it very well. But basically, all we mean is when you're removing governors, 
just click the remove button as opposed to the remove appointment button. That appointment can stay there and they can still be taken off the board and they will appear in your historical members list. Again, any problems with that, drop us a line through the chat button. Next slide, please. Interesting question, actually, before you go oh, on. Go for it. There's been, a few, there's, there's been quite a few questions coming in. One of the ones about to, uh, asking about features. So I re-echo that point about um, do do let us know if there's things which make your life easier. I think the particular one Helen was asking about, she was asking about two, and I know they're actually on your on your road list already, uh, roadmap already, um, Ellie. Um, oh, great. Oh, no. em Emma's asked here, can some of the reports drop directly into a folder on the hub rather than being downloads, please? That's an interesting idea. I've often thought that myself, actually. So, Emma, I think, yes, no promises, but that one sounds like a really good one to me. And things like the um, uh, the sort of the uh, download to show you the um, documents which is one and signed off, which is the one you were showing earlier. I think that would be a really good example there of downloading into the folder. It's an interesting one. Oh. But sorry to interrupt your flow. And back to no, you. that's all right. That's a good one. We are we we um will be developing that that um marked as signed kind of reporting as well and we're actually you know looking at ways to make that more useful and do more things for you as well so watch this space on, the, on that note um a couple of things to share on the key for school governors um the first one is the reading list now this is fairly new this year but it is really important because I, I don't know about you if I'm on the key for school governors, I'm generally there because I'm looking for, you know, a template, a particular answer to a question. You want to go in there, find what you need and get on your way. Uh, however, like always, what we do now is we go on there, we look at something, we notice something else and we think, oh, I should really read that in a bit. Oh, and actually that would be useful for so and so. And oh, I've just noticed this bit of news and so on. And you end up down a big uh, key for school governors wormhole and you've forgotten where you started. And then three weeks later, when someone mentions something in a meeting, you think, where was that? All you need to do, if you spot an article that's useful, but you haven't got time for it now, click on the save for later little icon. And that will put it into your reading list. Your reading list is at the top right hand side of the screen. The bonus, double bonus about that is, let's say, for instance, um, yesterday, the, the school teachers uh, pay information came out from DfE um that's been sent out on a need to know so everybody oh there it is at the top um um so everybody knows it's changing within that article there's also links to model policies that will now be worked on and and you know sent out so if you save that article on the school teachers paying conditions it's hard to say isn't it like keeping children safe that's a different trick as well but if you save that on your list what will happen is that when we update the model policy when we update the things that come along with it you'll be emailed and i'll let you know too so it's just an added little bonus that i think really does save a lot of effort i all just want to heads up here as well um soon half term when the little makeover happens um, you will also be able to, if you're on Keep School Governors and you like an article and you think, actually, I want my boards to hear this, you can click on the little owl on Auto and it will share directly to your board's notice boards. And before the questions come in, yes, you can choose which boards to, to send them out to. So it might be a particular board of interest or all of them. You will also be able to add the training we have on Keep for School Governors uh, to your Governor Hub records at, at the click of an owl, as, a, as, as it's known here. So hopefully that's helpful too. Next slide, please. Moving a little further out, Clarks, I really hope this is useful for you. I, I, I'm looking forward to using it myself. Uh, notice board filters. We know we've had lots of requests for kind of a, a, a search in, in the notice board. So you're looking for stuff that's already happened. Technically, that's a really difficult thing to do. And I, we don't think we can quite do it that way, or at least not yet. However, instead, uh, the whizzes that are our tech guys have come up with this. And I think it's really useful. It enables you, admins, to set up uh, filters, tags, labels, whatever you want to call them. You'll see the one I've got there, November Agenda. So this particular use would be since since the last meeting, every time a conversation comes through on the notice board and I think oh, I must put that on the agenda, I tag it or I filter it with I put a label on it that says it's November agenda. And then when I come to write my November agenda, I can filter the whole notice board by that label. 
So everything that I've labeled as November agenda will come up and then I can pop them in. This is coming soon. It is only in sort of, uh, what do they call it, beta format? I don't know if that's what they call it, but it's basically been made. It's not quite finished yet. We need to do some testing. If anybody out there really fancies a play and a go and are willing to tell us what they think, do let us know, drop us a line in the chat bubble. Um, there you go. And then next slide, just for some further out things. Very briefly now, because I've not got detail here as such, we are going to tackle the skills audit. It's one of those things that we think done really well, can really make a difference. Um, it's going to be an integrated part of Governor Hub, so you don't need to do yet another thing. Um, it's going to really be relevant to the skills and the uses and the practices that we have. And we're going to really try and try and ensure that we can know experience as well as training, as well as um, articles read as all sorts of things and so we're really hoping that that will build into a real good picture of your board and all of your boards. We're also going to help you review your policies across your, your boards, make it easier to manage them, easier to report, not only know when they're reviewed by but who needs to do it and all that sort of thing so hopefully um, that's going to really make life simpler too. And the next one, we will eventually it's a big old job, this one, is to get a new version of the app. We know that you like our app and we know it's easy to use, but we know that you prefer to be able to do everything on the app that you can do uh, on the website. Loads of work has been done, but we're not ready yet. But when we are, we will certainly shout for some, uh, for some uh, help. And the last one. The poll. We like a poll. So... What I'd like to know, I've put some suggestions, some of the things I've spoken about here, um, some others. Uh, what we'd really like to know um, is what you think we should be working on next. I can find my, oh, look, there you go, Neil. Sure, problems. Beautiful, lovely. So if you could have a go, you can click as many as you like, things that you think, no, I really want you to concentrate on that. It's really important to us to know. We're not just basing it on this, don't worry. Keep sending us messages into the helpline because we do, we get all of them. We discuss all of them. Uh, we group all of them. We work out what's possible, what isn't, what needs to come next. So do keep talking to us. So we've put the poll up and hopefully you've got some answers coming in there, Neil. If it's none of the above, that's really important too, because if we've got it wrong and these aren't things that are remotely useful to you, we need to know. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh... Yes, this is fascinating. Right? This is sort of live oh, feedback. Good. I love this aspect, isn't it? It works really well. Uh, yes, we've got the lots of comments. And actually, while that's going on, there's um, a question came up about how do things work if governing body buys Governor Hub, but not the key? That's a good question. Yes, so um, the way that works. So Governor Hub standalone is, it works entirely fine. If you've got key for school governors, then that will just magically appear. But if you don't buy Keep School Governors, then uh, you, you won't see that. So that's that all works quite cleanly. In terms of clear favourites of the um, features you uh, uh, yeah. highlighted, I don't think there's, there are actually any uh, clear favourites there, there early. I think um, policy reviewing, quick, quick and easy making that, I think that probably reflects... Um, but that really is something which consumes a lot of time from um, from clerks, particularly. Um, you know, if you if you look at the policy list for most schools, it's actually enormous, isn't it? And you you know, just keeping on top of that, I think is a is always a challenge. Um, keeping making it easy to assess governance skills, track progress. Uh, I think, yeah, again, that one is fits well with what we think about with the skills audit. But again, I think it's uh, it's something that's uh, come to mind for a lot of clerks is how do you make sure that governors are, you, you've got a good spread of knowledge and skills across the whole board, and that's always been maintained. Absolutely. I did see in, in some of the questions as well, I saw, I've, I've noted all the comments about um, declarations and confirmations and, uh, you know, how, how they're laid out and when you know... I've, Log that. I've um, heard that one, and we'll look at that too. And I also saw the one about um, visits, school visits, and how we look at monitoring those. And that's a really, really good one. That is, that is that's on the list. So um, do keep sending in the in the messages. But uh, that's it from me. 
Thanks, Ellie. Yeah, and just to emphasize, we, 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 we never make anything up ourselves here. It's almost everything we do is based on feedback from governors, particularly from clerks and also from governor services teams. So, yeah, keep that feedback coming. Um, now, very poorly as an experienced chair, and I would be having stern looks for my clerk at this point. We are running behind. But if we can just take a quick break now. Um, it's 22 minutes past, according to my watch. We'll resume in five minutes' time. So at 27 minutes' time, we'll kick off again. But take this opportunity to pop the loo, a cup of tea, and I'll see you back at 27 minutes past. Super. Okay, right. Now, have I pressed all the right buttons? Have I turned on my video? No, I haven't. There you go. I'm back. Hi, Anne. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Murray and Carolyn as well. Right. Splendid. Good. Well, thanks everyone. I hope you managed to fit in a quick cup of tea. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to our, our esteemed panel. So, um, Jackie, you've already met. Uh, Carolyn Chowdhury, uh, experienced clerk to governors, and I think it's right, yeah, what I'm saying, Carolyn, the former outstanding clerk of the year from the NGA. Um, That's correct. So Back in 2013. 2013, gosh, time flies, time flies. Um, next up is Moe. Moe works for uh, Lead Academy Trust, one of the larger multi-academy trusts that, that we work with, but also that uh, gives another perspective on clerking um, within, a, within a trust. Uh, and last but not least, um, Anne Robinson. Uh, Anne runs her own clerking service. Um, down in Kent, and uh, I've worked with Anne probably for about eight years now. I think um, one of our first uh, one of our first customers on on Governor. So welcome, Anne. Um, well, panel, um, I'll be taking questions from the uh, from the Q and A as they come in, but. Um, if you don't mind, I'll start with one of my own. I think often we can focus on um, it being quite a challenge being a clerk, and we tend to focus on those things. But the first question, what, what in your experience has been the most fun part of being a, of being a clerk? And perhaps I can turn to you first. Most fun? Um, I don't know always about most fun, but sometimes things that I'd say are the most satisfying. Um, I think the, the, the real sense of being able to make a difference to the quality of governance around the table because you're there every time, um, I think is, is hugely satisfying. Um, you get to meet a very large and varied amount of people if you work across, as, as we do, work across a multiple local authority areas. Um, and actually, often the biscuits are good. <laughs> well, I've never experienced that that particular one, um, but uh, there's a few nodding heads around the panel. Uh, Moe, how about within a math? Uh, what would you say has been the most fun, or as uh, as Anne quickly says, actually, most satisfying aspect? No, of course, and again, I think what, what Anne said there is, is that those two kind of key points are no doubt kind of a very common thing. I think kind of taking that one step further is the kind of the most fulfilling part of, of the role of a clerk um, it, it, anywhere, I think, but also in the mat is being able to provide support for uh, volunteers, which governors are volunteers, unpaid volunteers, to get the most out of the role so that they can support their schools, um, so they can feel that they're getting the most out of their voluntary role as well. But that's the, that's the greatest sense of, uh, of achievement from that is just, in some cases, unlocking potential for, for governors to carry out their role and fulfill their needs. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jackie, I, I mean, I, I guess you touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, what in terms of sort of most fun, most satisfying aspect? Getting to talk to Anton de Beck, possibly. In the well, real... obviously we all do that. <laughs> but in the real job, it's really picking up Murray's point, I think. Um, it, it's for me about um, when somebody says to me, somebody contacts me usually by phone, and they're very anxious. They don't know what to do with whatever problem they've got in front of them. And just before they put the phone down, they say, I feel so much better having talked to you. That really is heartwarming. Mm. 
Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? I think that as a as a as a governor, as a chair of governors, um, that those are the points where you 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 need your clerk most. It's those points where it's really difficult. You're not hundred percent sure what to do, which way to go, and stepping at those points is, uh, is it, from a governor perspective is very uh, well appreciated. Uh, Carolyn, what, uh, what what's your experience been of the final satisfying aspects of clerking? Well, also, I'm trying to find and think of something that's fun. Um, but I think from a satisfaction point of view, it's the realisation that with each year you're doing things better, you're moving things forward. When you look back on things you did years ago, you think, oh, that's awful. We do that so much better now, so much more efficiently, so much better use of trustee governor time. And that, for me, is what keeps me going. It's a challenge of constantly doing things better and more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's very much close to our heart in terms of that efficiency. I think Clark's tells us they say about half an hour of meeting now. And that is the thing, more than anything, that gives me a buzz about what we've done with Governor Hub is just saving that time, and particularly the dull time, taking that off of Clark's. That's something exactly. I really found uh, very satisfying. Um, next up is, uh, is around training, actually, whether... Um, what, what's the panel's view of training available for clerks and should there be some level of nationally recognised qualification for clerking? I think there are a few, but I'd be interested to get your, your views. Um, Murray, perhaps I could turn to you first. Uh, yes, well, I, I'm a relative newbie in the world of clerking. I think this is my, my third year of, of supporting governors. Um, so I, I think... The, the more training available, the better. I think a national, you know, that national accreditation is, you know, is obviously really helpful for, for people in you know, who are clerks or wanting to become clerks, but also for the, the employers as well. I think it adds a, an extra level of kind of credence as well to that. So, I, yeah, I think you, you can't get you can't get too much training. I think. And what about certification? Is that something that um, you think is would help the sector what, what do you think I, I certainly think so yeah again i think that there's you know there's a wide variety of different certifications for other industries and professions i think that's there, there's no there's no argument i don't think for, for not having that in, in the clerking profession as it, as it is as well yeah and and i think you know recognition of clerks is something we've discussed over a couple of coffees maybe even a couple of red wines um but in terms of sort of um Training certification, what do you think? Um, I, well, I, I would agree with the, the principle that it's difficult to get too much uh, training. Um, and I would, yeah, I would support the principle of certification being available. I think the problem is, is that um, it's quite difficult sometimes when, when, the, when often people come into clerking as a very small additional job. And how do you how do you square some of those circles? I think around around that as well. If you're going to keep ratcheting it up, now one would hope what it would mean that would be that the the whole profession professionalizes. Uh, but I think that's quite a journey from where we are at the moment. Yeah, I think, and um, that comes on to a, a thing later about the term governance professional versus clerk. It's quite an interesting one, but we'll come back to that. And uh, now, I don't think it's something you said, but I noticed this Jackie has dropped. Uh, I think, uh, yes, she's dropped off the panel list as well. So, um, Carolyn, uh, uh, what's your experience of Clark, uh, particularly training, but also uh, whether there'd be benefit in having some sort of national qualification? Again, I think a national qualification would be useful to some people, um, but not everybody. Um, I find my own training either through local authority, NGA, governors of schools. There's loads of stuff out there now, modern governor. Um, so I feel compared with years ago, there is so much available. And actually, you can spend as much time as you want doing it. And I have to limit myself sometimes. <laughs> Good meeting behaviour there, Anne. Was you raising your pencil to make a follow-on point? Oh, well, I was trying there. I think it's also about 
what the training includes and involves because I think mm. my experience when I I mean I recently um, went back to school uh, on a session or on, on a um, on a certification course and the procedural stuff it's always the procedural stuff it's actually not the procedural stuff that people need support with mm. I would suggest the procedural stuff is very easy to read from what are now really quite easily available handbooks and guidance from the DFE and everything like that. It's it's the, the Jackie Weaver moments that I think, um, you know, clerks need, clerking professionals, governance professionals, whatever you might want to call them, uh, need most support with perhaps in, in that training arena. That's, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So those, it's the things that are often referred to as softer skills which makes them feel less uh, less important. I think they're almost more important. I mean, um, Jackie, we were just talking there about training certification. I noticed you had to drop momentarily. Um, and within your role on with local councils, did you, did you have any sort of formal training or has there ever been any sort of um, national certification? Um, yes, there is a national certification, um, which... Um, it was very funny, really, because I had been training people in it for about five years before I took it myself, <laughs> and the pressure was really on. Goodness knows what I'd have done if I'd failed. Um, but actually, what I had done more, more recently, um, because I was seeing that it was um, really picking up an answer, well, I think, um, that there was really a huge need for it. Um, I took a degree in counselling, um, and I was a qualified mediator. Um, because I did spend an awful lot of my time doing what I frequently call hostage negotiations. <laughs> well, actually, perhaps that brings us on to uh, uh, another question here that's coming on the Q&A. Um, Jackie, you can interpret this one slightly differently, but um, Nicholas' question is, what would be your advice about how to best negotiate between heads and chairs who are both experienced but don't always listen? brackets to each other brackets to me so there um i can imagine this this is quite a common occurrence where the clerk is almost piggy in the middle between clerk and chair um carolyn perhaps i can <laughs> come to you first on that one yeah um i find these days clerks and chairs ones i work with anyway get along reasonably well and there is respect on both sides. Um, the clock can get involved and have done in the past. Um, and in you know, pre-COVID, it was quite good for the three people involved to get together and sit down and have a good chat and sort of thrash it out and um, come up with the way forward. As I say, it doesn't happen with my boards these days. The odd thing comes up, but um, nothing that's unsurmountable. It has improved a lot from years ago, I feel. And do you think that's just your influence or just generally heads and chairs have got better behaviour? Maybe, maybe it's the schools I clerk for. <laughs> yeah, I suspect that, that may be the case. Hmm. Um, and, and Murray, uh, perhaps, I guess that sort of triangle of chair, uh, chair head, Clark uh, extends a little bit within a map, doesn't it? Because you also have um, local board chairs, chairs of trustees, and so on. But um, have you ever found yourself in, in that sort in court between two of those uh, those personalities? Um, yes, but we're not in particularly dramatic circumstances. Yes, but there, there, there can obviously, run, as any working relationship, be moments of friction. And again, I think you know, we were talking about that, those soft skills earlier. You know, the, the obviously very helpful for the clerk to develop. You know, that professional rapport with with everybody that they're working with, but obviously particularly with, with the chair and the, and the and the head teacher. So trying to diffuse those situations from starting in the first place by keeping those. And I think that's one of the great things about Governor Hub as well is to allow those channels of communication to be as open and as transparent as possible and as easy as possible as well, so that there aren't misunderstandings or yeah. There are, there are as few opportunities as possible for those kind of conflicts, those yeah, those adversarial relationships to develop because the clerk is using the, the government system and other systems to facilitate that that information and that, that communication. Really. You know, in, in terms of the map perspective, 
yeah, there are there are different um, people on you know in, in terms of the educational um, team. We have directors of schools. Um, we support head teachers, and we have a chairs forum at Lead Academy Trust, where we get all of the the chairs or a representative from the twenty five academies in Lead Academy Trust for a two minute well, and currently virtual meeting to again discuss and share best practice and and, and receive kind of other um, information and updates from from, a, from senior executives in the trust. So again, it's opening up those forums and those channels of communication to, to again minimise those those confrontations happening in the first place. Yeah, it's interesting isn't it, how um, good or bad communications can really help or hinder those those relationships. And I think particularly now, you know, when we're relying a lot of that electronically, making making good use of communications within the board is, is, is really important. I think one of the important things, and Jackie, you talked about this uh, earlier, is is exuding that quiet confidence, which can really help, you know, as a clerk, you know, to resolve issues before they happen. But in terms of your quiet confidence, how, how did you develop that? Is that a particular skill, something you're born with, something you learn? What would you say? It's nice of you to put the question tentatively as you did, Neil, because most people start with, you were very confident, <laughs> you were very calm. <laughs> And I'm thinking, okay, well, actually, if you watch the clip again, you'll see two things. One, you'll see that I've gone incredibly red, <laughs> for me, a real indicator of stress. And secondly, I can't quite breathe. You know how when you hear when someone's nervous, you don't have to listen for it, but I can hear it um, because people keep playing it to me. So I'm going to do something with the time listening to it. Um, and I can definitely hear the, the stress in my voice. And I know that my, um, you know, we had to put the uh, members into the um, waiting room. My hands were shaking so much, it was difficult to get the mouth really? over the, the icon. <laughs> um, so what do I do? Um, for me, my way of dealing with it is um, to kind of be focused on what it is I'm trying to achieve. Um, and really, and you have to work at it. You know, it comes more naturally, but I'm a lot older than everyone I can see on the screen. Um, you can work on actually shutting out the noise. And for me, that meeting, I was very clear on what I wanted to do. All I wanted to do was get the meeting started. Once the meeting had started, it would be okay. That wasn't just keeping my fingers crossed. I knew it would be okay. Um, because all the chairman wanted to do was shut the meeting down. So once it started, we would be, we'd be all right. Um, so that was the only objective and although you know I watch it and of course I'm now very much aware of what happened I don't think I was really experiencing <clears throat> in real time so for me be clear on what it is that you're trying to achieve that night and try to drown out the rest of the noise that's there because the worst thing you can do is get involved in it yeah I think that's you and not just for clerks that, that sort of focus on the outcomes is a, actually a really good tip for, for chairs and governors generally I think is you know so sometimes you have to navigate a, an, a, an unexpected path to get there but focus on the outcome. How about you Anne have you have you ever sort of found yourself caught, caught between chairs and heads and uh, perhaps how, how have you dealt with it? Um, well yes definitely um, not often I'm very pleased to say um, I think it it depends on the, the gravity of the situation. I, I noticed in the chat um, somebody had put around um, how chairs attending training, chairs training helps. Uh, and certainly that's something I would be, I would advocate just as a baseline. Um, I would also say that head teachers perhaps need to engage in a little bit of training around what the actual uh, respective roles are sometimes. Um, I think sometimes for me, it's always about coming back to remembering why I'm there, you know, remembering that I am there as an independent advisor to, to this group of people. I am supposed to be independent. It doesn't matter that they're paying me for that. Um, and so I, I need to be honest. Um, so that's what I try to be in a very nice, friendly, um, flexible, professional way. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, I definitely echo that that point around um, head teachers and chairs 
having good training to understand their role, but really importantly, the role of everybody else around the table. I think sometimes that, that can just be, just be lost uh, and get in the way of that, um, that being focused on where you all want to get to as a group. Um, next question, it, it came up in the chat previously to, um, to Sharon actually, but I, I, I pinched it, which is um, the, there's been a bit of a debate in the, in the sector recently about the use of the term governance professional. Um, and should we replace Clark with governance professional? In fact, we, we, we had a look at this recently on GovHub to say, you know, should we just change the terminology we use? Um, we put a poll out there and we got 50% saying one thing, 50% the other. So we were, we were none the wiser. But just to, thought I'd throw it out to the panel, really, in terms of that terminology. Do you uh, do you have a particular preference? Um, Carolyn, perhaps I can start with you. I've never had an objection to being called clock. Um, but I think the case for being called governance professional is becoming stronger especially in the Academy Trust Handbook this time, they've used the word, the phrase, governance professional. So maybe it's coming. I don't really mind what I'm called. I still do the same role. Um, I just think that sometimes to some people, the word clerk means minutes and agendas, and that's it. But anyone who sits on a board will know it, it's more than that. It's up to you to promote what you do. So it's not, it's not a problem for me. I'm happy to be called clerk. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the clerk. Oh, okay, that's fine. We'll get somebody in from the office to take, take the minutes. No! Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, think, I think perhaps as a, as, a, uh, as a sector, we've moved beyond that. But I, I still hear it. I still hear it. It's shocking. Uh, Murray, do you, do you have a particular preference or, or view on this? Governance professional versus uh, uh, clerk? No, I, I fully support what, what Caroline said. Uh, I just, um, I think it's, a, it's a, perhaps a given the, the, perhaps the trajectory in the, in the sector in terms of multi-academy trains, et cetera, as well, that, you know, the, the providing other clerking support for not just governors, but for trustees and for other kind of support for executive meetings as, and, you know, everything else in between there. So governors professional, you know, could, could cover a wider field perhaps than, than, than clerks itself, but it's, um, you know, as long as both have got the the, uh, the cachet behind them to give the respect to, to people that fulfil those roles, that, that that's that's what matters, I think. Yeah, and I think that's that's part of the motivation, isn't it, about using government's professionalists to to sort of um, raise the respectability of the role and raise the respect it deserves. Um, so yeah, I think that's part of the push. Um, and you you've been in the sector. For some time, do you, do you have a, a take on this? Um, I, I suppose to an extent, what well, I do, I very much echo what has been said. It's about the respect that individual people are shown. It's about doing the, the job. Um, we've used the term clerking professional quite a lot over the years as almost like a, a kind of halfway house, if you like. Um, I think that some, some people as well, because again, because of the nature of the employment of, of a clerk, or governance professional or something in between. Um, at the, the top end, when you really are the person that knows the stuff and is delivering training perhaps alongside that, is supporting the executive, um, is writing the various frameworks and schemes of this and schemes of that, yeah, definitely you're in the arena of, of governance professional. Um, but people need to get there, don't they? Uh, and actually it can put some real stress and onus on people as they're in the development stages of their, of their career, I think. Mm, that would be yeah. sort of my take. So, um, you know, I know it scared people that when we first started talking about it probably four or five years ago about what should the role be, um, were we undervalued as, as using that term clerk? And people went, woo! You know, I, I'm not sure I know enough for that title. Yeah, and I think the, it was really brought to the fore when the clerking framework was was published by the DFE, wasn't it? And you looked at everything. You said, well, what would a really good clerk be able to do? 
Oh my goodness, it's a it's a long a long list, and it covers a lot of skills, but also a lot of knowledge. It's, it's, it is interesting. Uh, and Jackie, I mean, uh, from your your take in in, in your arena, is there a, perhaps a similar debate about the term that should be used for a clerk? Yes, I mean, there's lots of examples. Um, in my particular job, um, they call me the um, chief officer. Um, but many of my um, peers are called county secretaries, a historic term. Our clerks to councils um, are often um, changed to council manager or uh, even chief executive. Um, I'm not sure it actually makes a huge difference, except in one situation, and that is recruitment. Mm. Um, and I think certainly in our sector, I can't speak for yours. Um, what we find is that a lot of the skills that a, a clerk needs in our role um, are actually the kind of things that, that transfer very nicely from business, that business people weren't coming forward and, and showing any interest in them. So that council manager kind of thing helped. Um, so it, it, you know, when people were looking at the job adverts, they were more likely to apply from outside the sector um, when they saw something other than clerk. And that's a really good point to end on there, I think, which is that that's probably one of the biggest issues in um, the this, this sector right now is recruitment. I don't think I talked, I mean, we're, uh, we're probably dealing with about 70 or 80 clerking services around the country, not a single one of them um, isn't facing that issue of, of, of recruitment of clerks. Um, and several factors, one is, one is turnover, one is the pay, which Sharon touched on earlier. But there is that other factor, which is, you know, attracting from a broad field, bringing in people from that, the, uh, the business sector, from the legal sector in, into, uh, into, our, into our education focus one. It's very interesting. Well, look, thanks ever so much, um, panel. You've been, you've been fantastic. Thank you for, for, for coming along. Um, and, and also to you attendees today, that we really hope you found that that useful and interesting. Um, I've got a little bit of sorrow in me to say that, you know, we, we, we have to do this online, um, but yeah, hopefully at some point we'll be able to do this this face-to-face, -face, at least in, in part. Um, we really look uh, like to get your, your feedback on everything we're doing at, at Governor, but uh, and particularly on this conference. So there's um, uh, a link we'll send you about a survey if you could fill that in just take a few moments ah oh, i can see joe's just posted it up in the chat we really appreciate hearing your your views because um this i think looking at the numbers today this has been the biggest conference we've ever run as governor hub um so there's one benefit of uh, of running online but uh, it's been fantastic to see everyone thank you again to our panelists and uh, have a good rest of the afternoon thanks everyone Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for inviting us. Yep, thank you. Thanks all.